Jonathan. Welcome to the 911 Nonsense Podcast. Uh, if you could just give me a little introduction about yourself. Yeah, my name's Jonathan Kidd. I've been in EMS now for, give or take, about a decade. Um, for the last, I, know, I guess I'm actually going on seven years as a medic. And three before that as an intermediate and an EMT basic. Um, I got a background in volunteer firefighting. That was whenever I first got into the field. Um, currently doing um, very, very, very rural transport EMS, uh, which is, I've kind of dubbed as the EMS nirvana. You know, good calls, low call volume. It's a pr- really great scenery, really great scenery. Um, have an, e- an ER background as well. I have an education background. I am uh, currently an instructor for one of the local colleges. I have a dispatching background. And yeah, I work way too much. Don't we all? <laughs> Don't we all? What would you say got you into EMS in the first place? Oh, that is the question that I love. My, uh, my ex-wife was working on getting into nursing school at the time. Had a lot of trouble getting into the program. And... She decided that she was going to, you know, try to keep going through school because she was at a standstill. She did in her EMT basic, and I helped her study with it. And she always said that I was always gra- able to grasp the the concepts better than she ever did. Mm-hmm. So she's like, okay, so why don't you, have you thought about taking this class? Because I was at a dead-end job. Like, I was, you know, early to mid-20s at that time and, like, really needed to get out of this job. So I decided, okay. I'll do it, and then maybe I'll become a firefighter. Like I had the entire intention of going into this to get into the fire department. I did one day of my basic class, and I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. Let's see how far I can go with this. Um, ultimately, I mean, I, I did say I did some volunteer firefighting, but uh, that was for maybe a year and a half. I never went career, uh, and that was in a very rural service. And I, I ultimately never ended up as a firefighter. Um, That's all right. I ended up doing my EMT intermediate pretty shortly after that, probably within a year. Uh, and then I was just kind of at a lull. I didn't get into the It took me a long time to really get into a full-time position in the field. But once I did, I did it for another year and a half, and then I got into medical school. That's awesome. What would you say that your biggest challenge in your career has been like so far? I think that there is, there's kind of a... I mean, we know that financially, like EMS is not a super high paying job. I think those that really stick in this field, we find ways of making it financially sustainable, I guess would be the term. Through lots of overtime. Yeah, through lots of <laughs> overtime or lots of gigs. Yeah, that overtime is really, and really, really uh, exciting whenever you're first starting out. Yeah. And I think we, you know, like I, I said that I've known you for pretty much my entire career. I know how much overtime you used to work. I think we both ended up working way too much overtime because the money was really good. But we know I that agree. over time, that's not sustainable. So I would say that's honestly like one of the biggest issues. Of course, like there's the physical toll it takes on your body. If you're, especially if you're doing like a 911 EMS, tra- like an ambulance transport gig, I think there's a lot of, a lot of people don't take into consideration just the, the toll of, or just the physical stress that it goes onto your body. Um, poor sleep habits, you know, you and I both work night shift at one point in our career. We know that sleeping during the day is not always the easiest thing to do. Especially Usually, when you have a family or yeah, absolutely. significant other. And I think these are all things that we adapt to. Um, and then just the calls itself. You know, I don't think anyone, I think us as a, as human beings, we, we're not really designed to deal with, we're not designed to see a lot of the horrible things that we may see. And I'm not saying that I've had these horrific scenes where there's blood, guts, and gore. But, I mean, it's it's a uh, it, it varies from person to person. Sure. And kind of leading into that, you know, what do you think or what do you feel for you personally has been the worst thing that you've seen? Um, I think the, one of the worst calls that I've ever had, and it's one that I, I can think of two. I had a pediatric call where it was basically an overdose call, an opiate overdose call. She got into aunt stash and ultimately like when i look back at the call not a whole lot was really awful about it but there was something about that call that i took very personal because the patient that i was treating looked very similar to my friend's daughter at that same age and that really resonated with me for years um 
that was like a big trigger for PTSD, having nightmares. And what's funny is, you know, for me, for PTSD, I don't relive the call how it happened. I relive the call in what could have happened. Sure. But that one really stuck with me. It still sticks with me. It's still the one that I work through in, in therapy. Um, and then there was another one. Um, it's, it's actually the first field intubation I ever had as a medic. Um, and it was a young adult that overdosed. The homies dropped him off at his girlfriend's house in the driveway. He was in pulseless and apneic. Um, and I think ultimately what ended up like really sticking with me was that could have been me. I have a lo- I have a long history of substance substance abuse issues that I've been sober with for well over ten years. But I mean that easily could have been me at nineteen. Yeah, it could have been any of us, right? Mm-hmm. At that young of an age. And you know, I think it's it's really interesting how a lot of us are like, oh man, we have all these really bad calls. They're the worst calls, the worst things that you can see ever. But then some of our personal own worst calls for us were ones that when you tell other people, it's not really that bad. Yeah. You know, like it's funny to think about when people come up on the street and ask you like what oh man you've seen all these cool things what's Mm -hmm. the worst thing you've ever seen and when you flash back you're not going back to all those dead people you're not going back to all the blood and guts and all of the things that you've had to do in your truck or in somebody's house you're going back to the one that really just stuck with you Mm -hmm. you know what i mean going down uh ptsd how do you think that that has personally affected you from your career i think in some way shape or form i always like i knew there was a risk going into this field I accepted it, and I, I, I still truck through it. Um, if I could go back at the very beginning of this job and this period of my life and be like, hey, this is going to affect you mentally, emotionally, physically, et cetera, I would still do it. Why do you think that? I love what I do. I have a really cool job. I have, and I've had a really great, and I, I would say a very successful career. I've had to learn a lot about myself as far as how to process trauma and how to process the horrible things that we have seen in this career field. Um, thankfully, I have a great support system with my family. I have a great therapist, um, and I've gone through my fair share of it. I think for me, with just dealing with the PTSD of it, is just accepting that, hey, it's there. It's part of us. It's part of me. Um, and then just being able to really just kind of acknowledge and then just slowly be like, okay, how are we going to work on this day, day by day? Sure. And when you, so you said that you kind of knew that you were coming into this field that was going to cause you a lot of PTSD. So were you prepared? Were you already seeing a therapist at that point? Or did you wait? Or was there something that triggered you to go out and get a therapist? Um, I was not seeing a therapist when I first got into this. Um, I probably did not start seeing a therapist. Okay, let me back up. I've been in and out of therapy since I was probably a teenager for various things. When I started, I guess, taking my mental health seriously in this field was probably a few years in. It's probably after medic school. So I was probably about five or six years in when I really was like, okay, I need to start seeing a therapist. I had like a really dark point in my time, but there was, there was a lot of personal stuff going on on top of just, you know, the job. Medication-wise, I knew probably shortly whenever I first got into the field full-time that I needed to be on some sort of antidepressant and something for sleep. Um, as far as like the actual PTSD stuff and treatment for that, that was obviously much later. What do you think about PTSD in general in our field? Oh, it's a very real thing. I think that there was a really long period of time where it was never addressed. It was never it was never okay to talk about. I think we've hit a point now where either we've because we've lost so many people in this career path. Um, that it's it's a very I think it's a much more open topic to talk about now. Are there some that probably have it? They don't address it. They deal with it, and they're on their other ways. Absolutely, but I think it's become a lot more acceptable to talk about versus hey, you gotta kind of suck it in and you know bury that really deep. Do you recommend that people follow the same route? I think you have to follow the route that is going to be right for you. I'm a firm believer that. If you're going to go through the through inpatient therapy or outpatient therapy, but seeing a therapist, that you've got to find a therapist that's going to work for you or work with you. 
um, you got to have like a really good vibe between um, the person that you're paying money to talk to and try to analyze what you've been through. If you're not, then I mean, you're, you're wasting your time. You're wasting the provider's time. So I think honestly, like it's 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 obviously person dependent. Um, what works for me may not work for you. And yeah, I think it's also a mindset thing. Do you personally have any triggers that you notice in yourself when you're like, okay, I need to step back. We need to need to take a minute. We need to take a break. I try to keep an eye on my on my compassion fatigue. Um, I think I think one thing that I've really benefited from, especially with my full time job now, is I don't have the the high 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 patient contact that I used to have. You know, I looked at my numbers just this last year, and I'm probably running the lowest patient contacts that I've had in ten years. So that that's that's been wonderful. You know, I work for a service where I run maybe two, three calls in a forty-eight, where I used to run twelve in a twelve-hour. So burnout is not nearly as bad. When I do start to notice, like, hey, okay, it's time that I need to, you know, take a couple shifts off, go to TRC and soak in the hot springs or something like that. I can, I'm, I'm much more in tune with that now than what I was whenever I was working for one of the larger systems. So would you say now that you're out of this like? high call volume uh, environment, would you say that you have a better balance between life and work? Oh, absolutely. Now, please don't take this in a way of like, I, you know, I still work a lot, but the way I break it down is a lot easier. So like on average, I'm still, I'm probably still working like 60 hours a week, but it's spread out a little bit more. It's not, I'm not working like nine, 12 hour shifts in a row. I I do my 48. And I'll do maybe a six hour here for one gig, a couple hours here for another gig. Yeah, I'm at like probably the most balance I've ever been between job and personal life because like I can go out and play golf at least once a week, and that's been kind of that's become like my normal thing. That's what and I didn't and know. I and I didn't get to do that before. <laughs> I've always I've always been really creative. I've actually been able to play my guitar a lot more. Um, I should be doing more photography stuff, but I don't. Yeah, do what you want, man. <laughs> I can sleep now. Uh, it's, I, yeah, like li- life right now is very, very, very peachy. That's awesome. How do you feel about cannabis for PTSD? Now that it's, it's recreational here in New Mexico, you know, even before it was recreational, you know, a lot of people were still using it, I think, in our field. But now that it's recreational and we're seeing a lot more people utilizing it, and even in the hospitals, we're seeing that they might not be testing for marijuana specifically, or they are testing for marijuana and they are just, people just aren't getting in trouble because mm-hmm. I think it's becoming more recognized as a useful tool for PTSD for healthcare providers. I've read a lot of papers on it. I do, and full disclosure on this, I work for a system where that's still drug tests. And I obviously with that, I cannot partake. Now the papers that I've read and the research that I've done just in my own you know, my own boredom. I think that there is a lot of benefits for really anybody that is dealing with, you know, anxiety, um, depression. I think that there's a lot of, I I really do think that there's a lot of benefit for it, Um, especially if our more traditional remedies of Western medicine aren't working for you. Now, I think that there's also uh, too much of anything can be a bad thing. Sure. So I think it has to be done responsibly. Me personally, I would just love it to be able to just sleep. Like not even for like the psychoactive aspect of it. I would just love to be able to have an unmedicated eight hours of sleep. And do you think that you're not receiving that because of your PTSD? No, I'm not receiving that because of my insomnia. Okay. Which I've had, I've had insomnia longer than I've been in EMS. There was definitely a long period of PTSD where it was, it was affecting you know, my sleep levels. But I mean, this is also, you know, like in the last five years, two to three of them, I was working night shift. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in the last 10, I would say a good third of that, I was working night shift. It's not just the mental health aspect of it. There's, There's a lot of other stuff. I find that insomnia, you know, PTSD can kind of be combined in this field because a lot of people struggle with sleeping in general you know oh, absolutely uh, it's hard to define whether or not it's 
previously related or people have been in long enough that maybe it's not PTSD, it is insomnia. But. Well, think about it. You know, they tell us now that, uh, you know, when we first started this, do you ever remember being told about blue light? <laughs> no. Yeah, and it's... I think the only time I was ever told about blue light was maybe whenever I was playing video games, the video gaming classes that were the bright yellow lenses. All ref it blocked out this wavelength, uh, so it would decrease eye strain. Think about just the amount of time you spend looking at a computer, your phone. Uh, if you're on duty, you have your cardiac monitor, you have your ventilator. We have a lot of stuff that can really affect our sleep patterns. Not to mention that, you know, you were telling me before we came on, like you're on this really, really like rotating schedule every few weeks. So you have that. Um, in my field, you know, I work a set 48. So there's no guarantee that I'm going to sleep the entire night. And I think when you're working at a station, you always have like this little bit of anxiety for mm -hmm. the pager to go off. You're kind of always expecting for those tones to go off. My district is really neat because there's pre-tones. So like we'll get like a, this Z-tron tone and then we'll get like what district is going off. So we kind of already know. But at night, we don't have that on. Yeah. You're just going to get your pager that's going off and blasting you in the ear in the middle of the night. So I think there's a lot of things that we do that don't really help us out <laughs> when it comes to being able to have good, healthy sleep. Um, for me now, I, I try to make sure like, yeah, I try to make sure to have the... Uh, the blue light filters on on my phone whenever I was working nights and dispatch. Like, I even had that on on my computer screens, like, the entire shift. Yeah, and it's not something that they teach you about. No. What's funny is, like, even more so now, like, I've even been really good about trying to limit, like, my caffeine intake. Um, so I try to, like, really not to have coffee after, you know, like, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I try to limit my soda intake. I can't tell you the last time I had an energy drink. So, like, I've really tried hard to figure out, like, okay, what are the best ways I can maximize my sleep? Now, for me to fall asleep, it takes a lot of medication. Um, and that's something that I've been working with uh, a specialist with. It's like, I, because I'm 100% I'm dependent on that for sleep. Um, I can't take it whenever I'm on shift because then I'm not functional. Sure. So I have to get really creative with that. But, you know, it's just, it's, I do my best. I think we all do our best. For you, what do you think are the best parts of your job specifically i know you're you're in a teaching capacity and you're working on a truck so as far as just truck work i work in an area that's absolutely gorgeous it is beautiful out there it is it it's is. green um you're in the mountains it's fresh air all the time um, unfortunately fresh air brings allergies so mm -hmm. i've had a really this this allergy season actually has not been too bad for me just yet I work in an area that's got a lot of cultural history, and being able to learn about that has been incredibly fascinating. It's as weird as it is, like you get to meet new people. Yeah, is it going to be most of the time it's like the worst day of their lives, but you can still like go in and talk to them and, you know, hopefully make them laugh. That's always been like my way of treating patients. Like hopefully I can get, even though this day sucks for them, I can hopefully get them to laugh. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's still, I'm still helping people. And that's always been why I got into this. I got into this to help people. So you're helping people and you're getting to see some of the best parts of New Mexico. Oh, easily. And not all of us get to see. Oh, easily. <laughs> easily. That's awesome. I've had some great camping spots up there. Yeah. And I know you do You do photography as a side gig. Mm -hmm. Do you take your camera out there with you when you go? Um, I don't. Um, there's, uh, there's some cultural policies involved with that. Where I work at on the Pueblo, we, that's a, a huge no-no. You know, but if we're up north where it's really green, up in the mountains, I've been known to snap a picture of the ambulance in a really, sure. really beautiful scenery <laughs> area. But uh, no, a lot of the times, like I try to, I try to get like the stuff that I need to get done around the station, um, and then I, I read a lot. What are some of the tools that you carry in your personal bag that you have to have with you at all times? Mm, boy, that's that's an evolution. Because I remember when I first started, I used to carry anything and everything. And I always said, I was like, oh, I'm helping my partner out by carrying this crap. Um, I think the most that I carry right now, I carry a set of Leatherman Raptors mm -hmm. on a retractable cord. That's because, a good idea. Yeah. Those tend to walk off quite often. Yeah. And they're not cheap. <laughs> no, they're Holy not cheap. Holy crap, they're not cheap. 
Um, but that's that's probably like my number one thing. I just started carrying a little pouch that has a 1cc, a 3cc, and a 10cc syringe. Just It's just quick med access. If I need to give a med real quickly, it's, and I have one that's got a mad device in it. And I, so that's just a little pocket thing that I carry. I'm probably the worst about carrying a pen, which as a paramedic, you should be carrying a pen with you at all the yeah. time. But I mean, I haven't touched a paper chart in I don't know how long. That's pretty good. It's like everything we have is on that's tough That's pretty book. rare. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's probably a bad one. I should at least be carrying a Sharpie, but I don't. <laughs> um, my girlfriend just got me the little eco module. So I converted one of my yes one of my keyloscopes. Kilo. <laughs> I still carry mine. It's orange, bright orange. The whole reason why I have those set scopes is because of you. Yeah, I know. I have multiple <laughs> of them now. Uh, but yeah, I have one of those. Uh, I have one of my keyloscopes modified for that. Um, I haven't really noticed like if that's like a if it's been very beneficial yet. But like it's nice to kind of block out road noise whenever you're trying to do assessments. Yeah, I'll have to but hit you up on that later because with flying, I've been considering getting one. Supposedly, you can connect them to AirPods. Supposedly. Oh, that's great. I haven't tried that out yet. But um, there's a few of us up there that have the Kilas, and we, or not the Kilas, but the, the Eco Mods, and we've been very happy with them. I used to carry a Hemostat for really as an IV pole. Sure, various reasons. Yeah, never for actual like blood control because mm-hmm. that's really out of protocol. But I used to carry that. I don't think I do anymore in my wallet. In your wallet, yeah. that's a, that's pretty light. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, that's it's, pretty light. What's, what's funny is like whenever when I first got it, I used to carry a carpe jacked, a pen light, shears, hemostats. There was a protocol book in there. All your Ricky rescue. Gear, yeah, yeah, it was bad. Protocols. It was horrible. <laughs> and I think everyone deserves to go through that. I never did the fanny pack, but no. God bless the ones that did. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I never did either. I never did. But yeah, I, I I I really don't carry much anymore. I do have a I do have a I do call it my Joey bag, and there's really nothing in there except for my adult stethoscope. I have a pediatric stethoscope. They're both modded to do the echoes. There was like some medication, so I used to keep Dramamine. Because go figure that I would be working in a rural setting and I get motion sick. Yeah, well, when you're going up the hills, up yeah, and down. Yeah, so then I always keep a bottle of Dramamine, uh, chapstick, crap like that. But like as far as I mean, that just lives on the meta catcher. But other than that, like, I really don't carry a whole lot. I, I think know. most of us carry a little pharmacy with us at all times. Yeah, and it's really just for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I used to carry the vomit bag in my, in my pocket. Mm-hmm. I don't remember who told me that one, but I used to do that. Actually, my service doesn't even carry vomit bags. We just do basins. That's dangerous. A little bit. That's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Especially if they don't have, like, the reverse flow valve. Yeah. I never, I never realized, like, how, like, that's a pretty small piece of equipment. I never realized, like, how much I would miss that. Would you so, say otherwise, though, that you're, that the company that you're currently working for provides you with all the tools you need? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm very blessed with where I work at currently. Like, I, I honestly say that we, for a ground transport unit, I think we probably have some of the best gear. Um, we have really nice monitors that are we, we actually just had a uh, meeting with uh, our monitor rep and our monitors are at their end of life stage and they're like your monitors are probably in the best shape i've probably seen out of any other service um i am spoiled by nibp oh sure i think ma- the majority of us are yeah when you utilize correctly <laughs> yes absolutely we have we do have events it's one of the little pair packs i've never used it actually mm-hmm. We got video lar- laryngoscopes, which mm-hmm. that was that was neat learning. So I just our side not too long ago, yeah. and I did not use ours. Really? Yep. Old school. Dropped it in first There's try. There's On the airplane, no problems. Oh, you did it in flight. Uh, we had just landed. Oh, okay. Yeah. I do QIQA for my for my service, and I am. I'm easily the least experienced medic with 10 years of experience at this service. I got people who have been doing this for 30 plus years and they're legends in their field. And I will never, ever argue with them if they don't use a video scope. It's, I, 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 it's a tool. If it's something that you're comfortable with, cool. If you can do direct visualization, that's even that's awesome. Yeah, it kind of goes down the same route as, as the bougie. Some people love the bougies. I'm 50-50 with it. Uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the bougie. 
Uh, I think if you're utilizing it because the cuff is bad on your ET tube and you want to change it out and replace it, mm-hmm. great. Absolutely. Great idea. I think when you're in flight and you're trying to put it in and feel the rings, you're not going to feel it. I've never felt the rings. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've done, I say this like I intubate a whole lot. My last airway was a nasal tube. And this was so years. Cool. And this was years ago. <laughs> Um, but I think the last time I actually did a, a true blue intubation, I, tr- I'd use the bougie. I didn't feel the rings. No, no. Yeah. They push it pretty hard. Like you're going to feel those rings as you drop it in, but there's, yeah. and I see the benefit and I've read the papers on it. Like I, I get the benefit of the bougie. Like, you know, you have a, you have a very long piece of plastic that, you know, you pass it through the cords. You keep going to hit resistance. Yeah. You know, you're going to be in. So going back to stories with all of your experience in high call volume EMS, what would be your favorite partner story? Because we deal with our partners every day. You are married to that oh, yeah. person. No, I, I my my last partner is still my best friend. Ooh, let's come back to that. I have to. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to think of a really I'll let good you one. Think of that I'll one. have to have really really think about that one. How about what is your favorite call ever? What's a call that you think about and it makes you smile every single time? You know what? The one that I have that actually really still sticks out to me is actually one that I actually had no patient care on. I was a dispatcher for it. Um, We got a phone call from a hospital up in Colorado that uh, a patient in Albuquerque, a kiddo, was getting a heart transplant. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, we, they're just like, hey, we got, we got a heart for this kid. What will it take to get this kid up there? We're like, call them, have mom bring to the airport, and we'll we'll just go. It's very very straightforward, and like we know, like if a kid's getting a heart, we know something bad has happened to someone else. That's just the that's the realization of it. But yeah, my service, we got to like they called up mom. They were at the airport in an hour, and that kid, from what the crew had told me, that kid was jumping up and down and that poor kid because he was jumping up and down was turning blue that's how bad his heart was yeah but he had a fun time flying on the airplane uh his heart surgery was successful his follow-ups have been successful that is honest to god in 10 years and for no for no patient contact whatsoever that was probably one of my favorite calls one that i actually had patient care on and I always said that this was not, like, I, I could have cared less about delivering a baby. And I ultimately did not deliver this baby, but I got to, uh, I got to be present for my friend's uh, kid's birth. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And I got to transport the kid and his wife, and we still talk about it. I still get pictures to this day. Um, it was really weird, because, like, I go up on scene, and I didn't, I didn't know where they lived. But I go up on scene, and I see Dad, and I'm like, why do you look familiar? It's like, oh, I work at so-and-so. It's like... Hey, that's where I've seen you before. It's like, that makes a lot of sense. How are you doing? It's, it was it was cool, though. I'm just glad I didn't have to play catch. Yeah, sure. I mean, that, I think, for EMS, and not even just paramedics, but EMTs, too, is one of the scary ones, right? And people want to do it. I know. Like, that is like a bucket list call for someone. I'm like, you can have it. Yes. And I've always been like, do I get stork pins for this just to say that I got stork pins? It's like, no, you didn't actually get to play catch. It's like, oh, well, whatever. That's fine, too. <laughs> but I've had three of these calls now in my career where I show up, I don't have to play catch. And like, I was always expecting them to be really gory and bloody. No, I was like, I feel like this is, I feel like I'm being set up on this. Like, where's the camera at? Yeah. Because they were remarkably clean. I feel like you've gotten fairly lucky then because some childbirths, Calls are some of my worst calls. Oh, yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Oh, I 100% believe it. Yeah. So it's really cool and refreshing to hear that somebody's favorite call is catching. And not necessarily catching, but being there in the event. And it is really cool, right? When everything goes right, which it's mostly supposed to. Mm -hmm. We've been birthing children for ever. Centuries. Basically. Centuries. So getting to be present and experience that is really cool. Mm -hmm. And it's when you're there and everything's going really well, it is a very humbling feeling, right? Oh, absolutely. Like it's just one of the neatest experience experiences that people get to to experience, and not a lot of people do. But absolutely, as an instructor, like we we train students on doing this. Like we went through all the okay, well, this is what you got to do. You got to open up the OB, the OB kit, dig all this crap out. You can throw away the gown because it's a trash bag, and yada yada yada. 
But, uh, you know, like we always tell students, it's like, if you're having to play catch, this is something horrible is, is, has gone wrong. Because hopefully this day and age, like you had prenatal care and obviously some areas, you know, you don't have that. But, you know, we hope that prenatal care was done. They had ultrasound. We hope that there's no complications and that all labor just went really quick. And and I think that's kind of kind of what happened in the, the three cases that I've had. And, and obviously we always prepare like I'm like, OK, we're going to an active delivery I'm like, OK, I'm going to start reviewing uh, neonatal resuscitation and be like, okay, we're going to prep for the worst. And I was like, oh, the kid's fine. I'll, I'll take that. Any day. I, I've been lucky with a lot of calls because sure. it's like, I always expect calls to be way worse than they're going to be. And I've been very lucky. It was like, okay, these haven't been that bad. Sure. And I think you're in a really cool position where you're instructing. And I don't know what capacity you're instructing in, but when I went through EMT basic school several years ago, <laughs> we, you know, they taught us back then. It's this is the worst thing that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. This is the worst thing for the patient. Mm-hmm. This is going to be the worst thing you see. This is going to be the worst part of your life. Like you better be ready to oh, absolutely. handle this. Absolutely. And I think going back as far for PTSD wise, um, I think that that kind of put us in that position to to be expecting that. And I think that we're able to see now a really cool transition where we're going away from, well, it's not all like that. No. Right? Because we get into that. We're like, I'm going to see some cool stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some cool things. And now we're getting to a point where we're like, well, maybe that's like 25% of our call volume mm-hmm. for the year, you know, where we yeah. actually get to do something or feel validated, feel like we, we actually, we were taught how to take care of that and we did it and we did it well. I used to joke that PTSD started in, in the classroom in this field. And I'm hoping that I can kind of break that stigma. Like I get like with education, like, yeah, you're, you're getting a, a, you're getting knowledge. And this is what we've always told students. You're getting that knowledge basically force fed through a fire hose for a semester up to our medic program is four terms now and UNM's is still the two years if you're doing the bachelor's but like you're getting that that wide nose fire hose full blast for that entire time and I always try to I, I'm hoping that as an instructor that I can finally tell students like you know what it's not gonna be that bad yes that's a lot of information and I personally would love to do things just a little bit differently with the education side than how we do it now but you know we have national standards with that but I always try to tell them, like, look, in the real world, it's, it may not be this way. Sure. And that's okay. I would definitely say, like, as far as, like, when it comes to peds calls, like, yes, I've had my fair share of really sick kids. But I've been very fortunate with, like, these three um, deliveries that I did not have to catch on that, you know, baby's fine. And, and I, I made an effort whenever I did my L&D rotations in medic school. Like, I really picked the brains of the nurses and the providers in L&D and in the NICU because that's just a patient population that – we are not good at. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. Unless you have that specialty of transporting neonates and transporting peds, like your knowledge of peds, I don't care what anyone says, your knowledge of peds suck. Yeah. Um, and if you're not just a little terrified when you get that pediatric call, then you're lying to yourself. I know a lot of instructors that don't even like teaching pals because they just feel so uncomfortable with their, maybe not with their knowledge, but they, they feel like they're not, providing the correct or maybe the full amount of knowledge that they feel needs to be given for pediatrics. I believe that. So maybe that's something in the field that, you know, should be addressed a little more highly in EMS because we don't see a lot of those pediatric populations, unless you're in very specific, like you work in a pediatric Mm -hmm. ER, you know what I mean? We don't see a lot of pediatric patients, not enough to be keeping our education as high as we should. I, I agree with that. Um, you know, I look back with medic school and peds, the peds block was tied in with OBGYN. So that would be that that's what a 15 week class. And even at 15 that... weeks and, it, and and let's split that up. So because it's split with with two different with uh, two programs. So it's really nine and a half weeks or less than that. It's even I can't do math. <sighs> like seven and a half. Um, seven and a half weeks of peds time is nothing. Especially whenever you think about what we dedicate in medic school, like we're doing 15 week blocks on just cardiac, just the heart, neurology, respiratory. We're doing whole terms and we're expected to be like this very like entry level cardiologist. 
and entry level pulmonologists and entry level neurologists. You know, we're expected that, but when it comes down to peds, like we have seven and a half weeks, if not less. So I and I've always hated the term. It's always been like a knee jerk reaction when anyone says, "Hey, peds are like little adults." They're not. No, they're not at all. No. And something that I found really fascinating, I made a conscious effort to talk to nurses and providers from um, L&D, Mother Baby, NICU and PICU. It's like, hey, so like we don't see peds a whole lot. How do I do this and not freak out? Um, so I had a neonatologist that was like, okay, so if you deliver a baby to us, keep them warm, keep their head covered, and give them oxygen if they need it. It's like it's that simple to, get, to take care of a kid. It's like just get them to us warm and oxygenated. If you got to do other stuff, that's fine. But like if that's like the absolute bare minimum that you have to do, like if you deliver a baby on scene, cool, give it to mom, do skin to skin, like everything we were always taught. But like if you're having to do like some basic recess, they're like, you'd be surprised how much auction goes. Auction goes a long way in neonates. Sure. And we're talking about very, very, very basic level stuff. Like, okay, just maintain airway breathing and circulation. But be you'd be they're like you would be shocked by just giving like a little bit of blow by will probably do the kiddo a world of good. You know, obviously, that's a small percentage of what can end up happening. You know, you could have this super premature kid that you're having to do, like, a full coat on. And, yeah, that sucks, you know. But, um, like, I really took the time to talk to all these individuals. Like, okay, so what do you do for whenever, like, L&D, L&D in particular? Like, how do you treat eclampsia? And it's like, oh, we give mag. It's like, okay, well, how much mag do you guys give? Oh, two, two grams through a bowl. It's like, okay, that's what we do. Cool. Medicine's not different. That's awesome. <laughs> and then the L&D nurse would be like, okay, so like, what is it like in the field for all this stuff? I had one that was dying to do a ride along, and all she really wanted to see was an, an adult cardiac arrest. I was like, why? It's like, why do you want to see that? It's like, I just want to see how chaotic, like, I've seen it in the hospital. What is it like in the field? I was like, and I was like, we're, we're better at it in the field, I think. <laughs> no offense to No offense. No offense. <laughs> but I was like, if you think it's chaotic in the hospital, we're chaotic, but man, it's organized. And it's it's been really interesting working um, on an ambulance and in the hospital because it is two different. Oh, it's massively huge different. Huge different. And a couple weeks ago, I had a provider who got upset with us because we transported a motor vehicle accident. Mm-hmm. And the weather was so bad the last two days that that patient couldn't be transported. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we took him as soon as we could, and the neurologist was like, why wasn't he brought sooner? And you just look at him and you're like, are you kidding me? Like, mm-hmm. you can go out and fly in weather that's really detrimental to mm-hmm. both your safety and your patient's safety. Oh, but absolutely. It's just, it really is an insane thing to see the differences between the provider's in the field and in the hospital or even in flight in the field. You oh, know, absolutely. It's been a huge, huge change. So my very first experience with that, I would say this is probably like my first year in the field. As an intermediate, I got to attend on a, on a patient and it was just, it was a broken leg. And I had a very good rapport with my medic. Um, this was whenever we were actually able to get pain meds as intermediates. So we actually mm-hmm. were able to do stuff. Um, but I, I think I ended up giving this patient like 350 mics of fentanyl. And we took him to one of the area hospitals, an outlying hospital. And I remember talking to the, I was giving a report to the nurse and they're like, you gave how much fentanyl? I'm like, I gave 350 mics. And this patient was not small. This guy was a big boy, probably like a good 375 pounds. Okay, so 350 so... micrograms at half to one microgram per kilogram, like that's, that's really not, And I wasn't even, I think I was just a hair under his max at three micrograms per kilogram. Sure. Um, they're like, well, you're, you overdosed him. And I'm, I'm sitting there looking at him, he's sitting on the couch, or he's sitting on the gurney, he's semi-fowlers, and he's got entitled on, because, you know, that's what we were supposed to do, and not even on ox, he's on room air, and he's just chilling. Like, yeah, he's got a busted foot, but he's like, yeah, it's uncomfortable, but, like, I don't care about it that much. It wasn't even, like, and I, I didn't give him that to snow him out. I just made sure he was comfortable. Sure. But they, go, they put him in a coat room. They were fully expecting to, like, throw Narcan at him. They were probably expecting to, like, intubate him. They were calling down the uh, the met nurse to help out. I was just like, I'm, I'm really confused by what, what was happening with that. But, yeah, it, I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, and I, I, even myself. Um, I, I think I was very naive about what happens 
from pre-hospital to hospital care. Um, and I didn't really get that understanding until I worked in the hospital. When sure. I worked in an ER, that was probably one of the most beneficial things for me as a, as a provider because now I'm getting to see like, okay, so what what I what's happening in the ER, like, okay, does this patient really need an IV? Does this patient really need fluids right now? Um, Did this patient need a 12 lead? Yes, yeah. exactly. Just little things. And then actually being able to understand like, okay, so for certain complaints, this is how we treat, this is the labs that we're looking at. I found work going from pre-hospital to working in the hospital super beneficial. And I definitely, and it definitely changed how I practice mm -hmm. in the field. But I think there's a huge, I think a lot of providers, and when I say providers, I mean like physicians, specialists, especially in Albuquerque, since we're the, the center of, you know, we have the trauma center here. And um, I think a lot of providers are incredibly naive and I don't think they ever put two and two together of like, okay, so you're having, you're taking a patient from about as rural podunk out of town as possible where evidence-based evidence medicine may not always be the practice. It's going to be someone who's been a doc for maybe 30 years ish, ish <laughs> if not longer. And they're still like on the 1995 update of ACLS. Yeah. And I don't think they take into consideration. It's like, okay, so whenever you put a patient in an ambulance and you're bouncing them down the road, like you have less control of what's going on. In the hospital, even though as chaotic as it is, you have a very controlled environment. Yes. But when you're on an ambulance, you have to take into consideration how uncomfortable the gurneys are. Uh, road. I think I worked with you and you told me, don't ever go up Gibson. Oh, Gibson's terrible. <laughs> And that, that has stuck with me my entire career. It was the one and, only, one and only time you and I ever worked a shift together. Don't ever go up Gibson. And I've never done it. <laughs> so you go up there in your personal vehicles and it's like you're sailing dun, dun, in a dun, boat. Dun, yeah. dun, 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 dun. <laughs> that is something that has stuck with me my entire career. But that's something that we can control. Right. And that's kind of, I'm not going to lie, that's kind of why I'm doing this podcast, right? It's because we're sharing stories. And to hear that I had that much of an effect on you you know, several years ago. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. And pushing the podcast, I would like, you know, there's a lot of education based podcasts that are out Absolutely. right now. And those, that's great. That is great for pro pro professionals, providers, everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you're getting to share that information secondhand where you may not be sharing that information within your facility or within your own peers. And you're getting to learn a lot more stuff. And um, not everybody learns that way. But this is just kind of a different way that I wanted to push, um, not so much education, but yeah. through stories, uh, getting people to feel more comfortable talking about themselves and their own personal stories. Well, and I think that's one of my biggest, like, it's the one reason why I don't listen to, uh, listen to EMS podcasts. Um, a lot of EMS podcasts, like, there's some great ones that are that are geared towards evidence-based medicine that I'll listen to every now and then. I prefer to actually read papers than hear podcasts on that. But like most of the EMS podcasts that I've heard are very, I don't, I don't know. Like it's, it's not real. There's a lot of over dramatization of it. Like it's the same reason why I don't watch any of the EMS shows on TV. Sure. Like, I remember whenever they were talking about bringing that show. I don't remember, even remember which one, but it was one of the live EMS shows. They were talking about filming it in Albuquerque. I was like, dear God Almighty! It's like I, I remember my my old partner and I were sitting there. And it's like if they were to film us in the back of our truck and have all the equipment first off they're gonna be bored yeah they'd be disappointed <laughs> second off the producer is gonna have to have their finger on the sensor button because <laughs> guaranteed you're gonna hear something grossly inappropriate either from me or my partner because that's just the type of guys we are we are the biggest joke that me and tyler always had as being partners was like we are adults and someone trusts us with a box of narcotics and an ambulance right um, but, and then like they always interview the providers and it's always like, well, if we didn't do it like this right then and there, that patient's going to die. And I'm like, and I'm not trying to downplay anyone's emergency. I just, I just can't imagine that's always the case for that one provider. Sure. Maybe, maybe one or two out of 10, probably, you know, oh, probably even less than that. I mean, like, yeah. like I, we all had bad calls. Um, and I always joke that it's like EMS fishing stories of how much we can kind of play it up. But I'm just like, is it really like that? Or EMS bingo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, EMS week bingo. Yeah. Oh, I always remember that one. That's, but uh, that's I don't fun. Know. It's just, 
like first question you asked me, you're like, okay, well, what's one of the worst calls you ever had? And like that call, like like you were saying, it's like it's not a when I re, you know tell it back, it doesn't sound that bad. But to me, yeah, it was still a horrible call for me, you know. And what was horrible for you, I was like, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. But I I can I get that. I can get that it's a uh, we can actually sit down and have like a real conversation on, sure. on such topics. Yeah. So. So speaking of more topics, um, what would you say the most embarrassing thing that you've ever done in the field has been? <laughs> oh, this one's going to be good. <laughs> or you're having to think about it. <laughs> no, I don't have to think about it. Oh, goodness. Um, okay, so this actually would be a good story with uh, with my former partner. So Tyler, Tyler and I were partners for almost three years, and the dude is still one of my best friends. We both... Well, I say that I'm not in the field. I'm still in the field, but he is he's out of the field completely now and uh, is still hands down best friend in the entire world. Is he the one that posts pictures about snakes all the time? No. Oh, okay. No, different. different Tyler. No, okay. but, I, but I went to medical school with him. He actually just graduated PA school. Oh, Congratulations, okay. Tyler. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. Dude is hands down still my best friend. I was in his wedding. If I ever get married again, he'll be in mine. I'll, I'll get married again. But hey, hey, Gianna. <laughs> she knows. So... One embarrassing story that was really more for me was you never really, you know, middle of the night, you never really think about this, especially on long transports. You know, they always tell you, like, tones go off, go to the bathroom real quick. Yes. Same thing like a long road trip or anything like that. Yeah, I didn't go to the bathroom. Mm. Got to a call, and then I had to go to the bathroom. I had to ask the the patient oh. if I could use their bathroom. I was like, guys, I, I hate to interrupt. It's like, I know you're having chest pain. We're going to do a 12 lead on you. I gave you some aspirin. Can I use your restroom real quick? That one's pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And it's like, I feel like I just broke like a cardinal rule. Yeah. <laughs> go to the bathroom before. It's, I didn't have to go. It's pretty bad. But I think that probably more of us do that than you would imagine. Probably. You know, I... Uh, it's, it's definitely like clockwork tones go off, and it's like, oh, now I have to pee. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Um, I think one of my more embarrassing calls, uh, this, this call still pisses me off. So I will trump this call completely up to complacency. Completely up to complacency. Had a call, came out of a nursing home, alter mental status individual. Local fire department shows up on scene. They do their thing. It's a medic that I trust, uh, but like grossly altered. And I was like, okay, cool. Do you mind writing it with me? No big deal. So we're, I'm getting the report done. And this patient starts to deteriorate. So I'm getting ready to intubate him. Uh, ends up having a gag reflex. We just bagged him. And that sure. was fine. Uh, we get him to the hospital. Get him into the recess rooms. And I hear them call out the BGL of the patient. And it was like, it was just shit. It was like 30. And I was like... Whoops. <laughs> look at my chart. I was like, that says 78. I look at the medic from the fire department. I was like, hey, what BGL did you get? Because I could have sworn you said it was in the 70s. I was like, oh, yeah, that was in the 70s. And, yeah, the patient's BGL ended up being just trash. So they, they end up intubating him. Like, they went through, like, a whole recess in this thing. Whole issue with sugar or lack thereof. So they give him, they pump a full of sugar, they extubate him, they send him home. I was like, yeah. oh my God, <laughs> I almost intubated a hypoglycemic patient because I didn't do my own BGL. And I've always been one of those providers that I don't always do a BGL on, like not every patient needs a BGL. Sure. I do the ones definitely that I know that I need to do. I just, and I, the reason why I call it complacency is like I didn't do my own. Yeah. It's like that failure of not doing your own assessment. Well, that's hard too because... There's so many pieces of equipment, mm -hmm. and there's so many parts and moving parts oh, of, a, of a call. Absolutely. That is a hard one. If you ask them if they took check to sugar, you, A, trusted that they have checked their equipment mm -hmm. in the last week, that they've yep. done all the checks that they're supposed to, absolutely. and that they performed a blood glucose level correctly, mm -hmm. right? So if you heard that number, that's hard to say. I think it's hard for any of us to say that we wouldn't have done the same thing. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of us being in a two-tier system have learned, though, you know, to get your own vital signs. Absolutely. When you show up on a scene. And I'm glad that that patient had a good outcome. Oh, yeah. And that, uh, you know, it could have it been worse. 
Oh, it absolutely could have been worse. Yeah. It's just, it was just one of those things is like, like I, I'm not saying a BGL, I'm not saying that as a minute vital sign because it's not. It's just, it's one that, like I said, like I don't do it on every single patient because not every single patient needs it. We did it on this one and it was, it was just embarrassing. Like it, it's, it's like going to the hospital and you give this wonderful report to the providers and then they ask the patient, they do their assessment on the patient and they completely contradict every single word that you told the provider. It makes you look stupid. Yes. And I remember I used to take that personally when I first got into this. And now I'm just like, I, I just, okay, cool. People lie. It felt like that. Yeah. It felt like I was just like, really? That's, that's what we got. <laughs> was, their, their sugar was in the seventies, but it, it's, it's three. Like you were that person. I was yeah, that person. No, I totally, I totally get that. So speaking of that way, how about, how about we take it the other direction? Have you ever had a hunch or been concerned about a patient who wasn't necessarily critical at that time that you were like, we're going to this facility, you're going right now, something's just not sitting right, let's go. You get there and the facility is like, really? Mm -hmm. You brought me this? Yes, I do have a call. Um, I was in medic school, I was in internship for this. Uh, we ran on a fairly frequent flyer uh, like one of our ETOHers, not an urban outdoorsman or anything like that, but just one that we transported multiple times for being in, inebriated. Um, this gentleman was at home with family. They had been drinking all day. He had a fall and struck the ever-living crap out of his head on the countertop. And actually, I got two of these calls. Uh, but this one in particular really stuck with me. But um, unconscious the entire time. Like GCS of like four. So we load them up, we go, I do you know, do my IV, I did a 12 lead, did BGL, did all this stuff. And I remember we get off the freeway to go to the trauma center. And because this dude's uptunded. And he's, he goes from being completely untunded to completely alert and oriented over the course of like three minutes. And we were at about University and Indian School and started to decrease in mentation hmm. all the way back to com being completely unresponsive so you know i called my reporter and i was like yeah we need to if we can let's do a trauma eval so he ends up in a hall bed in the trauma room and that was fine and it wasn't until the next morning we brought a patient in very first call of the day we ended up and we talked to the nurse and the nurse is like you two i need to talk to you and i was like great what do we do oh, it's like being scolded by trouble. mom <laughs> yeah it's like being scolded oh, by no. mom so it's like we need to talk to you and this nurse is a good friend of mine now. When I first met her, we did not get along. And I got a really big apology from her because she's like, it's like, I owe you an apology because the patient you brought in yesterday that was unresponsive with had his head wrapped and whatnot um, ended up having a really wicked head bleed, like with shift, ended up intubated, ended nice. up having to have, like, have... Um, evacuation for the the hemorrhage itself and she's like i completely completely wrote that patient off and i was you know you think textbook wise there was nothing textbook about that made me think it's like yeah this guy's got a head bleed but it wasn't until that whole i'm unresponsive to like hey how's it going man my head hurts and that's like where am i at now and it, flat out unconscious again. I was like, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, I know what that is. That's bad. I recognize this from the books. <laughs> yeah. I, that's, you know, it's, it's like one of the few times I've actually had calls that were kind of textbook. Yeah. Man, and that happens so rarely. It does. I think in almost two decades, I've seen one, maybe two chest pains radiating down the left arm. Right? Yeah. And right? females, it just, never happens that mm -hmm. way usually you know i've not personally seen anything like that getting back to partners though so i can't say that i have a true like favorite time with tyler the two and a half to three years that we work together like i would not trade that with any other individual i've sure. ever worked with i've ha and i've been blessed with some great partners including you the one time we worked together oh, thank you we had fun <laughs> but i've actually i've been truly blessed with i would say out of like my entire career every partner that i've ever had i think i can probably count on one hand partners i'm like i can't work with you again please don't ever pick up my shift yeah and a partner can make or break your day absolutely so 
Tyler, 100%, like, if if I could get him to go back to the field and I could get him to work with me again, I would pick him any day of the week. There's just not – there's not one particular time in that two and a half years to three years that we work together that I can just truly key into – just a specific memory with him that wasn't good or bad. Like he was that level of partner where I never had to ask. He just did it. Sure. This is, this is like how like gross our relationship and our friendship was. <laughs> we had, we had almost matching cars. Our very oh, first that shift. kind of cringy. Right. Gross, bro. Right. <laughs> the bromance is real between me and him. <laughs> yeah. I can yeah tell. Our very, our very first shift, we were working um, at a, at one of the remote stations up in the mountains and he pulls up, He, I back my car up, and he backs up his car up next to me. I look at him, I was like, are we driving the same car? He's like, and we just kind of look at him, it's like, oh yeah. One of the medics comes out, he's like, you guys are driving matching cars? That's adorable. <laughs> so we knew right then and there, like our partnership was gonna be magical. Yeah. Um, <laughs> magical. Yeah, like um. we, we just knew. But truthfully is one of my best friends, I could call him up any time of the day and be like, dude, I need you. And he'll, he'll be there. He's one of my golf buddies. Um, we used to go to concerts like out of state. I think we went and saw Perfect Circle. He doesn't remember that show, but I do. Oh. <laughs> you know, sometimes those are the best shows. Yeah. There's great pictures of that show. <laughs> Sorry, Tyler. Blackmail. I have to, <laughs> I have to tell the story. Yeah. So, like, he tried to fight one of the Phoenix rescues oh, that was my driving gosh. by. Oh, gosh. But he's he's a solid dude, and yeah, I don't have one one story that just sticks out to where because all of them were good. Yeah, you know, like get done with the call. like we could talk shit about about a call, be upset that we we're going to it, go to the call, be the most professional, compassionate individuals. Because yeah, you have to let out that negative energy somehow. You do. But as far as the care that we provided, I used to tell people that. If you weren't sick, but if you needed an ambulance, you wanted us as your as your crew. Sure. Because we will treat you amazing. And we did. We had a lot of fun. And we like we read each other's body language really well because like I said, like I didn't have to ask for anything. He just did it. Like he knew the patients that needed to be twelve that needed to have a twelve lead. He had no issues taking calls. I think we didn't do this as an intentional experiment, but we kind of proved that you really don't need a medic attending on every single call. And I used to say that I got him really good at where he was with his medicine because he, you know, he anything that he could take, he would. He hated driving, which sounds familiar, huh? Just a little. <laughs> yeah, he, he hated driving, so it's like, okay. I don't feel like I, the patient needs a medic. I have a very strong, very capable intermediate that, that can take care of the patient. I'll drive. No big deal. So I used to, I've been told that I'm one of the better medic drivers. <laughs> the better medic drivers. One of the better medic you drivers. You don't hit as many curbs. No, no. Still, <laughs> I've, even, I've even been told like at the service I work at now, they're like, you don't drive like a medic. It's like, well, I sure hope not. I used to drive a bunch. I was an EVO for a long time. So, but yeah, it's fantastic partner. Still one of my best friends. We, uh, we, we. We have definitely created, uh, I don't know, did you ever have like EMS rituals? Like if you had a certain type of call, you needed to do one thing? Mm, no, not necessarily, but I am a pretty, I'm a superstitious person. Oh yeah, no, we are too. <laughs> no, we, um, I wouldn't say this is superstitious, but I would definitely say that this was, um, it just ended up being rituals. Like if we had a pediatric patient, it was an ice cream and a cherry Coke. Oh. Um, he taught me this one, trauma arrests got... A burger. I don't that know why. That makes sense. I've heard. Yeah. I've heard. Um, cardiac arrest. Oh, what would you, what would, coffee and donuts for cardiac arrest. If we got ROSC, code steaks. Code steaks. Code steaks. I don't know what a code steak is. You go out for a steak. Oh, you just go, go for a steak. Yeah. Okay. If you get ROSC, because I'll be honest with you, when I left uh, my last service, I, I probably had the lowest Ross grades. Like I used to, I used to get called like the angel of death by the other first responders because sure. they because they saw me and Tyler show up. They're like, "This guy's gonna be ten seven. Yeah, this is gonna be a DOA." And we had one student, one of my last medic students. We ended up having like three codes, and all three of them had Ross. And I was like, "This is gonna be a really expensive, really expensive <laughs> month." You gotta buy all the steaks. Yeah. <laughs> It's going to be a really expensive month. <laughs> That's and then funny. if, and I, I, in this period of time, I've never had this, but if you had a 
cardiac arrest with ROSC and the patient made a full outcome or had a, like a full quality Recovery, of life, yeah, yeah, then it was a vacation. Oh. We obviously never had Clearly. that vacation. I think in my career I had maybe one. I've had two. No. No, I had one. And the reason why I say that I had one is because I technically never laid hands on this patient. We just, like, they coded. They did CP, or first responders at CPR. They got pulses back right as we pulled up. I was like, cool, let's go. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's let go. go. So, but yeah, that patient made a full recovery. But I, I, I literally said it's like I did nothing for this patient. It was yeah. <laughs> that was done before I got there. I just transported. I just, I kept I kept him alive, but I did not. Yay for CPR. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> High quality CPR. If you could tell, or if you could give your younger self some advice what would it be you don't have to do it the traditional way meaning you don't have to you don't have to go to college right away after you graduate high school um going to a big university you don't even have to do that um i honestly would probably tell my younger self it's like hey this is what i did i recommend it worked great for me uh of you know i started working at 18 uh, I went to night classes at community college, and eventually I kind of found my calling and my path that I was supposed to be on. It took time, but I think uh, I think there's a lot of expectation for kids that, like, hey, you got to figure out what you're going to do with yourself at 18, and it's just not fair for them. Sure. I agree with that 100%. Well, I really appreciate you coming out and interviewing with us today. Absolutely. It's been this a blast. Absolutely. It's been a blast. It's been nice be catching up. It's been great hearing stories. I appreciate everything you've done today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Let's do it again. Yes, let's do it again. Thanks for listening to the 911 Nonsense Podcast. Please remember to comment, review, and share with friends if you enjoyed this episode. Join us next week for an interview with a flight nurse who discusses her experiences with COVID, PTSD, public appreciation, and more. If you're interested, we sell all kinds of noon merch at samspursuit.com. Again, thanks for listening and see you next week.